This brief lecture is intended as an introduction to panoramic radiographs, or Panorex as they are frequently called. I recognize that head and neck radiologists utilize this technique much less than dental radiologists, but an introductory understanding is important even within the hospital setting. This is a panoramic radiograph. It has a variety of synonyms, including orthopantomogram and panorex. Although most people use the term panorex, that's actually a copyrighted term from Kodak, so I'm sure they like it when we all use that term. This is an incredibly useful technique because it takes a very complex three-dimensional structure, the jaw, and lays it out flat so that we can analyze all the different aspects of it in a convenient fashion. So how is a Panorex acquired? Well, this image from the website of a manufacturer shows how the patient is positioned within the scanner. You can see that the patient's chin and mouth are in a predictable position as well as the forehead. This puts the jaw into a predictable position and it has to be very precise in order for this whole system to work. This component of the system has on one side the point source and on the other side the image intensifier and that spins around the patient but it spins in a very particular way that enables us to take a complex arc following the mandible. Here's an animated diagram that shows how the system works. This is the radiation source and, and radiation coming off of it. And this is the curved film that sits on the other side of the patient. This is a, a top-down view of the patient's head here. So we're shining the x-rays through like that. Now, when you trigger the system, the point source turns around the patient and takes an arc that exposes the film from one side to the other. As it is moving from one side to the other, the moment of rotation for the x-ray beam is exactly on the patient's mandible. And that's why the mandible comes out as a crisp object and everything else becomes blurry. This introduces some very specific artifacts to the image. When we blur out all of these soft tissues on either side of the mandible, those soft tissues can create loosened lines that we don't want to accidentally mistake for a fracture. So we need to review these artifacts and review the anatomy um, that shows up this way so that we don't make that mistake. Let's start over here on the side and look at these stacked rectangles here, here, and here. What are those? That's the cervical spine, right, as seen from the side. If we go to the other side, the cervical spine is over there as well. And in fact, blurred out through the center, the cervical spine is there as well. So the cervical spine appears in three different locations on this image. How about this line right here? What is that line? I mean, if you weren't careful, you might mistake that for a subcondylar fracture right through there, right? But it's not. It continues on beyond the bone. That's the earlobe, right? Now, here is the hard palate, right? But the hard palate comes back and comes down and curves down like this as the soft palate. And it continues on, and there's the uvula hanging down off the back of the soft palate. But be careful, that soft palate is on the other side as well. Here is the soft palate coming down, and there's the uvula hanging off the bottom. So some weird manipulation of the anatomy here. You can see the epiglottis sticking up, right? And the, the base of the tongue coming down. That base of tongue, that line of the base of tongue, very easy to mistake for a fracture line of the jaw, but it's not, that's just the base of the tongue. The other thing that blurs out is this line right here. This line and all of these blurry lines across here that are obscuring to some degree the ramus of the mandible, that's actually the contralateral mandible being blurred out so we can see this side of the mandible more crisply. Now, this is not a big deal when all you're blurring out is bone, but if you blur out, try to blur out metal, then you run into problems. 
Here's the problem that you can run into when you try to blur out metal. See this streak right here? That is a streak that you can't see the underlying anatomy through. What is that actually? Well, it's this metal on the other side of the patient. This, uh, these are embolization coils in a patient who wouldn't stop bleeding from their trauma. And this is, uh, of course, a reconstruction plate. But this are these coils smeared out on the other side. They're nice and crisp we're on the, when they're on the side of the mandible that we're trying to image. But when we go to the other side, they are blurred out along with the rest of the mandible. Now, most of the mandible you can see right through, but not the metal. That, that, that blurs out, but it's still very dense. It becomes an even bigger problem the more dense the metal is. So here there is something streaked out all over the area of interest that is the angle of the, le the left angle of the mandible. What is that? It's the right angle of the mandible and it's so dense because it's got these reconstruction plates, these malleable reconstruction plates uh, transfixing a mandibular angle fracture. It, they are obscuring the side of interest here on the left as you go, as you try to penetrate through one side of the mandible and out the other side of the mandible. So this can be problematic in patients who have a lot of metal in their jaw. Now let's review some of the normal anatomy that we expect to see on a panorex. The mandible itself has several parts. The, the central part of the mandible here, where all the teeth are anchored in, this is the body of the mandible. The mandible turns a corner right here, that's the angle of the mandible, and it heads up as the ramus of the mandible here. The ramus comes up and divides into two processes headed off. The more posterior of the two processes is the condyle. The condyle has a head and a neck. And the more anterior is the coronoid process. Why do you have a coronoid process? You have a coronoid process so that your temporalis muscle has something to attach to. When we're right here in the middle of the jaw, nominally between the canine teeth here and here, this is called the symphysis or the parasymphyseal region of the jaw. Now, if you look carefully, you can see these two parallel sclerotic lines running from the ramus and down into the body of the mandible. Those are two edges of a canal that's running through the mandible, the inferior alveolar canal. The inferior alveolar canal conveys the inferior alveolar nerve, along with uh, a small artery and a couple of veins. It runs from the mandibular foramen here, crosses the jaw to the outside of the jaw, and emerges as the mental foramen there. This inferior alveolar nerve is a branch of the of V3, of the third branch of the fifth cranial nerve, and it runs through and supplies the teeth on its way out the mental foramen, and then it supplies the skin of the chin. These teeth, this part of the jaw where the teeth are set, is called the alveolar ridge. And there's an alveolar ridge on the maxilla as well. There are several clinical scenarios where the panorex is particularly useful. Dentists use these all the time, but there are a few scenarios on the medical side of the street where we use them frequently. You can use them in the emergency department if a patient comes in with trauma and you don't suspect that they have a fracture. If you did suspect that they had a fracture, you would of course do a CT of their facial bones. But if you think there's a low likelihood of fracture and you'd like to do something before kicking them out of the emergency room, then you can do a panorex as a screening tool to look for fracture. The other situation where we use it in the hospitals for preoperative clearance, uh, in particular in situations uh, uh, where you're putting in a new cardiac valve. When you put in a cardiac valve, you really don't want to seed that valve. So any source of infection has got to be taken care of ahead of time. We use a Panorex as a screening tool to see if there is apical abscess or ongoing infection within the jaw that needs to be addressed before a valve is placed. So what goes into a normal dictation for a panorex? Well, I like to talk about three things in my dictation. The first is the temporomandibular joints.
I will at least mention that the temporomandibular joints are well aligned, that there's no subluxation or dislocation of the joints. These joints are discussed in much more detail in the lecture on TMJ MRI. The next thing that I discuss is the presence or absence of mandibular fracture. Even in patients who are being studied for infection, it's worth excluding that fracture. The classification of mandibular fractures um, and, a further, and a more complete discussion can be found in the lectures on facial fractures. And then the third thing we talk about in a panorex, which we frequently overlook or talk about minimally on facial bone CT, is the teeth themselves. So we'll spend more time talking about the teeth in this lecture. This is an example of a temporomandibular joint dislocation. This is the normal side, and you can see the condylar head seated nicely in the glenoid fossa. That's the normal relationship. However, on the affected side, the condylar head is out of the glenoid fossa, should be back here, and instead is projecting over the articular eminence that is anterior to the glenoid fossa. That's a complete dislocation. Sometimes the joint will simply sublux a little bit uh, and not come all the way out as in this case, but this is what a temporomandibular dislocation looks like, the condyle out of the glenoid fossa. Let's talk about the teeth. How many teeth does a normal person have? Well, if you've kept all of the teeth that you developed as a teenager, then you'll have 32, eight in each of the quadrants. So in each quadrant, you have two incisors, a medial and lateral incisor. Then you have a solitary canine. You have a first and second premolar. And then you have a first, second, and third molar. The third molar is often referred to as the wisdom tooth. The molars are often called tricuspids, and they have three roots extending into the alveolar ridge whereas the premolars are called bicuspids and they have two roots extending into the alveolar ridge. I should note that the alveolus of the jaw, both the mandible and maxilla, is the portion of the jaw where there are sockets for the teeth. I should also note that the tooth itself is, extends from a crown, which is the exposed part of the tooth in the mouth, to the apex of the tooth where the roots of the tooth are anchored into the bone. This is a diagram of a tooth that is socketed into the alveolar ridge. Here's the alveolar bone and here is the tooth itself. The extremely radiodense portion of the tooth that surrounds the crown is called the enamel. And you can see how thick it is around the crown of the tooth. Beneath that is the dentin. And the dentin is about as dense as bone, and it goes all the way around the tooth. In the center is the pulp. The pulp is a softer material, and it contains the vessels and nerves that feed the tooth itself. Notice that the, while the dentin goes all the way around the tooth, there are gaps at the apex to allow the vessels and nerves into the tooth. And bacteria like to take advantage of that. There is another important element here, and that is the periodontal ligament. The periodontal ligament is an extremely dense ligament that anchors the tooth into the alveolar ridge. It is an exceptionally good barrier to infection. If you think about all the infections that occur within the teeth and all of the bacteria that normally live within the oral cavity, this periodontal ligament needs to be a very good barrier to prevent us from having constant osteomyelitis of the jaw. In fact, osteomyelitis of the jaw is an extremely rare event outside of disrupted surgery, trauma, or radiation. Okay, here's the radiologic equivalent of what we've just been talking about in that diagram. You can see that the tooth runs from the crown to the apex, and along the crown is the super dense enamel, densest thing in the body natural thing in the body. Beneath that, running all the way around the tooth is the dentin, 
which is about as dense as cortical bone, and then inside that is the lucent pulp. Now, the periodontal ligament we know is running all the way around the tooth, but we can't even see it. Importantly, there's no visible gap between the tooth itself and the surrounding trabecular bone. That's normal. We don't want to see a gap there. Let's say that you're a bacterium. You want to get here to the apex of the tooth, to the tip of the root, where you can form a juicy abscess. That's your goal. There's a couple of different ways you can go about this. One thing you can do is you can drill through the enamel and then all the way through the dentin. And then once you reach the pulp, you're in good shape because the pulp is a great medium for infection and you can travel down along the root and to the apex of the tooth. Another thing you could do is you could come alongside the tooth. You could elevate the periodontal ligament away from the tooth, slide alongside the edge here, and find your way to the apex and accomplish the same goal. This is the difference between dental disease and periodontal disease. Here's an example of the most common thing that we encounter in the teeth, caries. Caries is a funny word. It's both singular and plural, like series is singular and plural. So you can talk about a caries or a bunch of caries. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for a lucency that is replacing the normal architecture of the tooth. This is a huge caries that's taking out most of this molar tooth. If you look carefully, though, you can see some other caries here. There is missing anatomy here in this premolar. That's another example of caries. Just another example to emphasize the concept on caries. Here is a defect within the tooth itself on the mesial aspect of the tooth. That is a dental caries. A cavity is the colloquial term here. There's a lot to unpack on this Panorex. For one thing, let's start with the periodontal disease. When you see a halo of lucency around a tooth root, as we're seeing here and here, that's periodontal disease. That's infection coming down around the gums, elevating the gums, elevating the periodontal ligament away from the tooth and forming an infection all the way around the tooth. As long as the thickness of this lucency is not different at the apex of the tooth as it is alongside the tooth, we wouldn't call this an apical abscess just because this has reached the apex of the tooth. This is still periodontal disease. Here's another example of periodontal disease running around one of the teeth. Now, what about this part of the alveolus here? It feels like this alveolus has just fallen away, eroded away, like the rest of the alveolus comes up to here, but this only goes to there. The alveolus has been atrophied. Well, this is an example of Wolf's Law, which is if you don't use a bone, you lose a bone. Uh, the alveolar ridge atrophies whenever a patient is a dentalist. This why it, this is why it is important to put in dental implants early after the loss of a tooth or you won't have enough bone to put the implant into. This is also a good image to talk about the difference between an unerupted and an impacted molar tooth. If a molar tooth, usually the wisdom tooth, if a molar tooth is trying to erupt in the teenage years and it runs into something, something's blocking it, that's an impacted molar tooth. But sometimes the tooth just decides it's not going to erupt, even though there's nothing in the way. We call this an unerupted molar tooth. So unerupted on this side and impacted on that side. Now let's talk about apical abscess. This is one of the most important things that we're looking for on a panorex. What you're looking for is a lucent ball or balloon around the apex of the tooth. So we can see here that the tooth comes down and there is a lucency that runs actually all the way from up there all the way down. It's a rounded ball-like lucency all the way around 
the apex of the tooth, that is what an apical abscess looks like. Now, to be fair, you can't look at this and say, yes, that is pus in there, because this could be a treated abscess, whether treated with antibiotics or because the body's natural immune system has walled it off and treated the infection. So you can't really tell the difference between an actual abscess and a residual cyst in that location. But most of the time, we have the, the reason we're doing the examination is to look for these infections. That's what we're looking for rounded lucency around the apex of the tooth. This patient, of course, has other evidence of dental disease. Look at that caries there. Look at that caries there. It's not just the apical abscess. It almost never is just the apical abscess. Here's another example of an apical abscess. This one's a little harder to find because there is a lot of artifact from the cervical spine overlying the central jaw. But if you look carefully, you can see this rounded lucency around the apex of one of the incisors, right? Another thing that's worth noting here is what happens when a tooth completely erodes. The entire crown is gone and all you're left with is a little bit of root uh, barely hanging on to the alveolar ridge here. This is called a tooth remnant and it's really important to pick up. In some cases, uh, the mucosa will cover this tooth remnant and it can be a nidus of infection. So important to look for that. It, it can escape attention because you, you don't even see a tooth there anymore. There are a variety of dental procedures that will appear on a Panorex. Uh, there's no way I can go through all of them. It's so complex. I mean, it's a field of study unto itself, but um, these are fillings, right? This is what happens when you uh, drill out a cavity and then fill it with material. This material is called gutta percha. Um, but we try, we usually use the more generic term dental amalgam. That, that phrase rolls out of my mouth a lot when I'm reading uh, panorexes. I'll, I'll talk about generically about dental amalgam to talk about any of the metallic density material that is in the teeth. In these teeth here, in these teeth here, the roots have been drilled out and replaced with gutta percha. This is called a root canal, and this is what happens when infection overwhelms the pulp of the tooth. You've got to just get rid of the pulp and fill it in with cement. Obviously, this entire lecture was just a bare introduction intended for radiology residents. Dentistry residents are laughing at us here as we try to encompass their entire specialty in a 20-minute lecture. But I think it is important to have at least some knowledge of this material if you're going to be reading CTs of the face and these specialized examinations, the Panorex.